You can find us online at rce-cast.com. You can find the entire back catalog there, all um, all these episodes we've been doing for these good number of years here. I also have again here Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and one of the authors of Open MPI. Hey Brock, how's it going? All right. Uh, as for upcoming events, uh, I will be in mid March, mid to the end of March, at University of Illinois at the Advanced Research Computing on Campuses, which is part of the ACI Ref uh, series of projects out there. I will be there. So if you're going to be there, please drop by and say hello. Also, uh, there's going to be a number of deadlines coming up for the Exceed 16 conference. That's the XSEDE, Extreme Scientific Engineering and Discovery Environment. This is the successor to TerraGrid. There's a whole number of items there coming up, tutorials, papers, uh, other things coming up there. So please take a look at those if you're interested. Okay, so Brock, we got something a little different today. This is different than the normal straight old HPC software or vendor kind of thing that we we normally do. But this is something actually people may have heard about in the news before because they, they have made the headlines a couple times. Um, we are going to talk to the people from D-Wave, the quantum computing people. So, uh, Brock, I wonder if you could tell us who our guest is. Yeah, so our guest today is Denny Dahl, who is um, from D-Wave. Denny, take a moment to introduce yourself. Yeah, hey, Brock. Um, yeah, I've been with D-Wave for a little more than four years. I'm a physicist, and uh, right now I'm actually at Los Alamos National Laboratory, um, I'm on assignment here. Uh, Los Alamos purchased a system from our company about uh, a few months ago, and I'm here helping the users get up to speed. So can you tell us a little bit about D-Wave, maybe a little bit of history? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, so D-Wave has actually been around for a lot longer than most people think. Um, the company was founded in around year 2000. Uh, we've been uh, we've been using venture capital since then. Uh, we were founded by Jordy Rose, who is a physicist from the University of uh, British Columbia up uh, in Vancouver in Canada. Now, what can you tell us? Start at the high level here. What what exactly is quantum computing? Because I, th- I think there's a lot of information out there, but from a semi-technical audience perspective, you know, how would you describe what is quantum computing? Sure. Um, regular computing, uh, or as we actually call it now, classical computing, classical computing starts from this notion of you've got a bit. You can control a bit. A bit can be a zero or a one. But um, over the last hundred years, physicists have realized that if you kind of tunnel deeply enough through the layers of nature, um, at its heart, nature has this quantum mechanical aspect to it, which means um, systems are not just a zero or a one. They actually exist in these superposition states. And uh, so the, the whole notion behind quantum computing is to start from that point of view and use the, uh, the fundamental uh, superposition aspect of really the basic building blocks of nature to build a different kind of computer than we normally think of having. And when you say different, what do you mean by that? Because it, it sounds like that is fundamentally different and is going to affect the, everything from soup to nuts in the design. Absolutely, um, it's that's certainly true. Because with a with a classical computer, you know, you can you can imagine that you've got you know a number in a register and another number in another register, and you can ask the machine to add them together and you're going to get a deterministic result. The same thing will happen every time. But with a quantum computer, um, at, at its very core, you don't just put a single piece of information into a, quote, register. Uh, you know, a register in a quantum computer holds a whole superposition of different information states at the same time. And so when you operate on, uh, you know, a collection of information like that, your results are necessarily probabilistic. So it means you have to think Think, uh, think through your computing model starting all the way at the ground up. So why would we even want to do this? I mean, normally we like to just do regular old math. So what's supposedly so great about quantum computing? 
Sure, it's a great question. Um, the uh, one of the one of the guys in the physics community who made this suggestion, uh, you know, that we should look at quantum computing um, uh, decades ago was a you know fellow by the name of Richard Feynman, and Feynman observed that um, certain kinds of physics problems that you might want to simulate uh, on a computer can be simulated efficiently. Um, things like partial differential equations and whatnot, you can map them onto a classical computer and get reasonable efficiency. But there are certain kinds of systems in nature, uh, Feynman observed, there are certain kinds of systems in nature that do not have this character. Um, the so-called quantum physics systems uh, cannot really necessarily be um, efficiently simulated on classical computers. And so Feynman made the suggestion, uh, I think back in the 80s actually, that um, in order to do a good, efficient job of simulating some of these quantum physics systems in nature, we're going to have to build a new kind of computer, a quantum computer, as opposed to a classical one. So... Quantum computing, and when you read it in the news, is talked kind of like as this holy grail. And it's going to solve all these problems, but you're actually building machines today. So, what people think about as a perfect quantum computer is that what you've actually got, and you've got a complete revolution, or are you like on the path there, and you've got something that's quantum-like? Oh, actually, uh, good question. Um, my 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 personal opinion is where we are is on the path. We don't have today a perfect quantum computer, and uh, you know I'm not actually personally convinced that such a thing as a perfect quantum computer will ever be buildable. But but the idea that we have t right now is we know how to put certain kinds of quantum mechanical devices together to make a uh, a useful quantum computing engine. It may not be the most general. Uh, possible one that people may wish to to you know that they can envision, but what we have is kind of a starting point which which we think will allow people to get their feet wet and actually start to experience what quantum computing is like and how it differs from classical computing. All right, let's let's talk about one of those things. So the, the typical model of classical computing uh, that is discussed is is a Turing machine. Right, it has a, a start and an end and a bunch of sequences that goes between the two. To put it super crassly, right? Is that the same here, or are we looking at just a fundamentally different model? Well, that's a that's a great starting point. In fact, after Richard Feynman, uh, you know, made this suggestion that classical computers were not really going to be great at simulating certain kinds of quantum physics systems. Um, it took uh, another person to sort of take the idea to the next level, and that was David Deutsch. And I think it was in the late 80s that Deutsch did kind of the reasonable thing, you know, based on the idea that you have or, or that Alan Turing had, you know, decades ago. Deutsch said, let's take a Turing machine, which, you know, it does exactly as you said. It starts off in a state. It reads something from a tape. It looks up some information in a table. It writes down a new symbol on the tape, and then it moves to a new uh, new new uh, square on the tape. So that's your classical Turing machine. Deutsch took that concept and he said, let's replace each of the steps in that process with quantum mechanical steps. And what that means literally then is that, you know, when this quantum Turing machine uh, enters a new state, it's not actually a new state, but it's a superposition of states. So that was actually kind of the first or the next step forward in the whole quantum computing uh, you know, thought process. The idea was how do we take something as simple as a Turing machine and recast it in the framework of you know, quantum mechanics? So how do you exactly represent these quasi-states where they're in a superposition of two states and also, a lot of times in quantum mechanics, you have a probability of being in one state or the other. So you are more towards one or the other, but you don't necessarily know. Uh, how do you do all of this? How, how do you represent it? Sure. Well, the uh, the representation, it's in some sense, starts off being uh, very simple. You know, instead of having a, instead of a qubit being a zero or a one. The words we say is a qubit can be in a superposition of the zero and the one state. And literally what that means mathematically is instead of just saying, you know, my qubit is zero or my qubit is one, now I have a weight. Uh, and it turns out to be a complex number. But I associate 
uh, a complex number with the zero state and another complex number with the one state. And the magnitude of those two complex numbers tells me, uh, in effect, uh, you know, does my system lean towards being a zero or does it lean towards being a one? Or maybe it's in a 50-50 superposition of those two states. Um, so that's the starting point. That's how one qubit is described mathematically. And then if you want to build on that um, and build a system that has got multiple qubits, uh, this is where things get fascinating real quickly. Um, so the uh, the concept in the quantum mechanical world that, that you hear talked about a lot is this notion of entanglement, um, which sounds like a very deep concept. It sounds like things being tied up in a knot. The, uh, the easiest way to explain entanglement is to first explain its opposite. So the opposite of entanglement is this notion of uh, separability. And separability is so common to us that we, we hardly even, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, it's such a basic concept in our world that we, you know, we hardly ever even think about it. So the notion of separability is if I have two, two separate systems like, uh, the door in my office and a filing cabinet, you know, the door in my office can be open or closed and the filing cabinet can be open or closed. So if you ask me what's going on in my office, I tell you about the door. I tell you about the filing cabinet, and separately, those two pieces of information tell you everything you need to know. That's separable. But it turns out in the quantum mechanical world, that principle you cannot apply. So it turns out if you if you entangle two systems like the door and the filing cabinet, it's not enough just for me to tell you about the state of the door and then to tell you about the state of the filing cabinet. I also have to tell you about the possibility of, you know, the door being closed and the filing cabinet being closed. The door being closed, the filing cabinet being opened. The door being opened, the filing cabinet being closed, and then they're both open. So all four of those possibilities gets their own weight in this big superposition. And that's kind of what's at the, at the heart of some of the power in quantum computing because as I add another qubit to my system, the number of uh, weights that I have to provide to you to describe that superposition state, that number of weights – doubles with every new qubit that I add into the system. So to describe the state of an n-qubit system, I actually need to provide uh, the number of weights to you, which is 2 raised to the power n. And that exponential right there is at the heart of what we think is causing quantum computing to be much more powerful than classical computing. So... If I understand you, and I, I have to hit, admit, my, my head is exploding a little bit right here, so I'm not 100% sure that I do. Um, if I understand you correctly, it, it sounds like there's a, a probabilistic nature and, uh, for lack of a better word, a, a multiplicative nature. Does, is there an inherent parallelism in the different states that are represented simultaneously? Yeah, absolutely. Um, some Some people that I've talk to uh, actually think of a quantum computer that has n qubits, uh, they think of that as being in effect uh, a, a computer that's got a degree of parallelism equal to 2 raised to the power n. Now, um, quite honestly, I think that that's maybe uh, a little bit of an oversimplification, but in a sense, it is the case that a quantum computer is effectively computing with this huge number of possible different states at the same time. So that is a form of parallelism, and that really does seem to be very uh, inter intricately tied up with the, the uh, phenomenal power that may be accessible to us through quantum computing. So then is this the idea that I have heard, again, maybe this is super crass way of, of describing it, but you're actually, you can try multiple inputs simultaneously, say this two to the n uh, different inputs simultaneously, and that's how you get this inherent parallelization and inherent power of what a, a quantum machine is? Right. I think that's that's not a bad uh, sort of a fuzzy way to think about what a quantum computer is doing. The only reason I'm a little bit hesitant to, to just give you a fully unqualified yes answer is that um, some people in the field are, are very uh, sensitive to that particular description of a quantum computer. 
Um, you know, for example, Scott Aronson uh, is 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 uh, I've read his blog a lot in the past, and I know that he's very, uh, you know, he he reacts strongly and negatively towards that particular description of a quantum computer. I actually don't think it's a bad starting point, but um, you know, once you kind of internalize that intuition, you have to go a little bit further and recognize that um, it's not really the case that each of these uh, parallel um, these parallel instantiations they don't they don't behave independently there's a very very tight coupling between all these different uh, so-called parallel degrees of freedom and so it's not it's not quite like you can tell each one of these different parallel instances of a quantum computer to go and do its own thing at the same time because there is a very tight coupling between all these different degrees of freedom so what is this good for, actually? So you described a number of problems that we can solve directly, numerically, but it doesn't sound... This this is all statistical. Uh, you know, if I wanted to know exactly how much money was in my bank account, I don't want to be plus or minus 35 cents or $35. So what sort of problems are these systems good for? Well, that's a that's a great question. And it's, you know, very, very important to understand that there are a lot of problems, uh, computing problems in the real world that are completely uh, adequately addressed by classical computers. Quantum computers are, are meant or thought to be able to attack a very uh, special uh, category of problems. So here was a big thing that really uh, just kind of like uh, electrified the field, and it was about a little more than 20, 20 years ago. In the early 1990s, a mathematician by the name of Peter Shor um, realized that you could actually use one of these hypothetical quantum computers uh, that no one had built at that point, and, and in fact, even today, only very, very, very small uh, versions of that kind of hypothetical quantum computer have been built. But Peter Shore realized that if you had one of those machines, then you could solve a math problem that has been uh, you know, a, a very important problem. You could solve it far more efficiently than you could on classical computers. Computers, and so uh, uh, Peter Shor's insight has has come to be known as Shor's algorithm. And what it allows you to do is take uh, huge numbers, integers, uh, not not floating point numbers, but integers, huge integers, and then uh, factor them. And the reason that that uh, kind of special sounding math problem uh, attracted so much attention is it's a difficult problem, especially on classical computers. And the difficulty of that problem has been used to actually build uh, a significant amount of the encryption infrastructure that we rely on every day when we do, uh, you know, e-commerce and and other kinds of secure transactions. So the the promise that a quantum computer might be able to actually break encryption like that uh, was really a revolutionary idea, and that that had the effect of you know energizing a lot of people in the physics and computer science and math community to start looking at this possibility of quantum computers way more seriously. So actually, that's probably the most famous thing that we've always heard about with quantum computers, that if they exist, that effectively all of our encryption that we currently use is broken. Um, I've always heard it described as you can pretty much simultaneously look at all possible answers, but it's really just this, this multiplic multiplicative factor you were talking about earlier, it can look in a much wider space, much more quicker than a classical computer. Yeah, I think that's a fair way to describe it. So that was, you know, uh, Shor's factoring algorithm was certainly uh, one of the first most dramatic uh, suggestions about what quantum computers could do. And, you know, in the, in the uh, intervening couple of decades since then, of course, a lot of researchers have, uh, have looked at this question of, what kinds of things could you do with a quantum computer that you can do much more efficiently uh, as opposed to uh, a classical computer? And there have been a few other answers that have come out of, of all that research. Um, so it, it really looks like uh, quantum computers, the, the, the attraction then is that there are, there's a very special class of problems that it looks like they can attack efficiently. Not all problems, but uh, some of them. And some of them look like you know very high-value problems high enough value to really motivate some serious, uh, you know, serious investment and effort and, uh, and money to try to see if these things could be made real. 
So this sounds like one, they're not necessarily going to replace classical processors for things where we want a very deterministic answer. And two, should I not be putting anything online because it's all encryption broken for every D-Wave customer that's out there? Well, we're not at the point. So, so uh, great question. Um, one of the interesting things that that's happened between um, you know the 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 time when Peter Shore uh, articulated his al- algorithm and today is um, there has been a new kind of uh, quantum computer that has been suggested by by researchers. Um, the original model of the quantum computer that sort of dated all the way back to uh, David Deutsch and the work that we were talking about earlier, that's what's called um, – it's it, today it's kind of referred to as uh, a circuit or gate model quantum computer. And sometimes people, um, you know, say, they, they think of those as the, quote, universal quantum computer. Um, those, those seem to be extremely hard to build. Um, the good news is that in the late 90s and around the year 2000, uh, several different research groups independently suggested a different kind of an architecture for a quantum computer. And that's the so-called uh, adiabatic quantum computer. Um, so the reason I'm kind of going off on this tangent right now is the adiabatic quantum computer is uh, significantly easier to build than the gate model machines. And so this is where D-Wave is right now. D-Wave has built and we are you know, uh, marketing and selling um, an adiabatic quantum computer. But the reason this, dis- this distinction is important is that Shor's factoring algorithm does not run on the adiabatic quantum computer. Uh, computer that's made by D-Wave. So the fact that uh, Los Alamos, Google, NASA, Lockheed have access to quantum computers, that does not at all mean that anything that you've got encrypted or any of your banking transactions right now are at risk. We're a long, long way from being able to attack uh, things like RSA with the current technology that we have. So then what are people using your machines for? So, uh, again, Brock said encryption is the most famously known problem. You've said there's other classes of problems. What kind of things are they doing? Can you talk about those? Sure. Um, the thing that is easiest to describe really is, is optimization. Um, it's uh, The natural programming model for our system is, is radically different from the programming model for a classical computer. So instead of having instructions that do things like add and multiply and divide, uh, do a logic test, branch, etc., etc., instead of having instructions like that, um, our computer really has essentially one instruction. Um, but that one instruction is very, very powerful and flexible. What that instruction does is effectively it, encaps- it encapsulates an entire optimization problem into a single quantum machine instruction. Um, and so one of the one of the ways that we kind of help people, uh, you know, we provide this metaphor for thinking about the way the way the machine works. If you imagine a mountain landscape. Um, you know, it's got uh, at, at each point of latitude and longitude. You know, you're either uh, you know you're either at a mountain or you're in a valley or something like that. The question then is, out of this complicated mountain landscape, where is the lowest point in terms of altitude? And so that's kind of a nice metaphor for what our system does, because our system, each instruction that our system executes, encodes uh, what what we think of as an optimization problem like that. You're looking for the lowest altitude, or it might be the highest value. And so each each instruction allows the computer to search through this large, large uh, search space and then return to you uh, a point which represents uh, a very, very good solution to an optimization problem. So we think of optimization as being one of the key, uh, you know, the key application areas for our system. Um, then the other ones we think about are machine learning. We believe that it's possible to cast a lot of machine learning problems in the language of optimization, and so we think we might be able to really uh, bring bring you know kind of new uh, algorithmic techniques to machine learning uh, through the quantum computing paradigm, and then the last one is this thing that we call sampling. Uh, sampling is this notion where 
you know, you've got you've got some probability space, and you're interested in picking samples uh, out of this uh, probability space according to uh, some predefined set of probabilities. Uh, this is, you know, for example, uh, you know, one of the things that physicists uh, do a lot is they run these so-called particle transport codes, where you might uh, imagine you've got a beam of particles that you know impinges on some very complicated uh, shapes, and then the particle transport code uh, is a Monte Carlo. In other words, it uses uh, random numbers to sort of try to figure out, you know, where these fluxes of particles ends up. So that's an example where you're effectively sampling from a complicated distribution. And we think something like that, uh, we might be able to attack that very effectively with, with this kind of adiabatic quantum computer as well. So those are the three areas we're, we're trying to focus on, optimization, uh, machine learning, and uh, sampling, or Monte Carlo. So you said something there, though, and, and you use very careful language that I'm not sure that the average computing person would understand. So when you're talking about, you know, like finding a minima or a maxima, one, how do you avoid the usual problem of getting stuck in a local minima or maxima? And then also, these are all, again, stochastic problems. So do you have to run this, like, many, many times and take, like, the best result returned? And, and how are you confident in that actual result? Yeah, sure. So um, uh, the, 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 the first point you brought up, the whole notion of, you know, how do you actually uh, navigate around this landscape and, and find a good value, um, what we do is so different from what a classical computer does that uh, some of the limitations that a classical computer runs up against – uh, it's, it's they they simply don't even apply to what our system is doing. So typically, with a classical computer, if you've got a complicated landscape and you're looking for a minima, um, your your classical computer somehow represents uh, a point in the landscape. And then with each computational step, you can imagine um, perturbing that point in the landscape a little bit, and you look to see whether uh, you know, you're know you moving in a good direction or a bad direction. And if you're moving in a bad direction, you discard that, that step. But if, it's, uh, if you're moving in a good direction, you'll keep that step. And hopefully by doing that over and over again, you'll, you'll go down, 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 down hill – and you'll end up, you know, in a good valley. So that kind of roughly is, it's a rough description of how a lot of classical computers uh, approach an optimization problem like that. But I think, you know, what you're alluding to is is a real problem, which is what if you end up in a valley, but um, there's a much better, deeper valley nearby you, but you can't get from here to there because there are mountains between you and the deeper valley. So that's uh, you. You could think of that as being a barrier. And with classical classical computing, it's it's really really tough to figure out um, how to build smarts into a program so that it can know that it should climb up and over some mountains because on the other side of the mountains is going to be a better answer. So those barriers are very hard to deal with in the classical computing world. But with our system, uh, the system is not at one point on the landscape. Instead, our system starts off effectively being like a cloud spread over the entire landscape at once. That's what uh, these superposition states that we were talking about earlier allow us to do. So our system effectively... Um, starts off in a very different place from a classical computer. We don't start at one point on the landscape. We're kind of spread over the entire landscape at once. And so this actually allows us to uh, make use of a very powerful um, phenomena of quantum physics, which is called tunneling. Um, and this is one of, the, one of the differences between the classical physics world and the quantum physics world. In the classical world, if you don't have enough energy to get over a barrier, you're stuck. Like if you're in a roller coaster and your roller coaster car is not going fast enough to make it up and over a hill, then you'll go partway up the hill and you'll fall back. But in the quantum mechanical world, um, it's absolutely possible for uh, a system not to have enough energy to go over a barrier, yet the quantum mechanical tunneling effect allows a system to effectively go right through the barrier. And so that quantum tunneling is one of the things that we, uh, we've tested, and we know that our system uh, exhibits that capability, and it's one of the things that allows us to do a much better job of, of finding those, uh, those minima in a large, complicated landscape. 
Um, I, I don't want to go on too long here, but but there's one other point you mentioned, which is these systems are stochastic. That's absolutely true. So when we actually set up one of these uh, optimization problems, um, there's a certain amount of setup cost associated with uh, defining that problem and passing it to the quantum processor. So typically, once we've done that setup work, we won't we won't ask for just one good value for our optimization problem. We'll ask it to return, uh, you know, ten or a hundred or a thousand uh, good values. And since the system is, uh, you know, stochastic uh, because of the quantum mechanical nature, then um, if we ask for a thousand answers back, we we will typically get. Uh, uh, you know, different answers, and some of those may be, uh, you know, great answers, and some of them may may be a little bit higher up in the landscape. But getting back a collection of answers uh, very quickly is one of the kind of cool, powerful features of of the adiabatic quantum computer. So, how does one even write software for this? Because what you're talking about is so fundamentally different from what I know about writing software, but then again, I've been writing traditional software for my entire career. Do you have a, a different programming language? Is it a different compiling method? Is it a, a whole different way about thinking of writing software? Right. It's not so much that the languages are different. Um, in fact, you can program our computer using C or Python, or we actually have a, an interface from MATLAB, too. Um, the issue is more that... Um, the way you actually uh, put together a quantum machine instruction for our system requires you to, uh, you know, to build something, to build a data structure in, you know, C or Python, and that data structure represents a quantum machine instruction, which you then can go and execute. Okay, that's actually super cool. I, it's incredible to be able to write Python to write something so powerful as this. Um, uh, let me ask you this. You you must have a separate quantum processor. Is this thing driven by a, a traditional processor with a traditional type of operating system that you can kind of view the D-Wave as uh, an analog to classic machines, uh, an accelerator? Absolutely. Yeah, so you, you do not ever interact directly with the quantum processor. Um, and, and that really is a, you know, that's a, that's, that's exactly how we refer to it. We have this chip, which is the quantum processor, but, uh, sitting in front of the chip is a completely standard, uh, classical processor where we run a lot of server and management code. So, you know, when I'm programming the quantum processor, uh, I actually, you know, I'll write C or Python or MATLAB, and uh, a lot of the action takes place between a client system that I'm sitting on and that kind of front end or host system. Um, but after I've done the work necessary to actually, uh, you know, create a quantum machine instruction and I'm ready to execute it, then, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll invoke a special uh, command and, you know, in my, in, in C or Python or whatever. And that's the cue for the host processor to actually send the quantum machine instruction down to the quantum processor and it goes through its exotic quantum mechanical dance and then reports the results back to me. Okay, so quantum mechanics, though, to be able to get quantum-like behavior observed, um, four years of nuclear engineering degree basically told me you need to have very tightly controlled environments. Even, you know, being above absolute zero introduces information into the system. Trying to directly read from the system introduces information. You're, you're governed by Heisenberg, right? So... How do you even create the physical environment to even support these quantum processors? Yeah, uh, that's a huge challenge. And, you know, what you're saying is exactly right. Um, these quantum mechanical, uh, you know, wave functions is, is you know, the technical uh, term for these things. These quantum mechanical wave functions are very easy to uh, disturb. And, you know, if, if you disturb them, uh, they lose their coherence and they lose their power uh, from the point of view of quantum computing. So we work really, really hard to create this uh, special environment uh, for the quantum processor, and it's running at very, very low temperature, a uh, very hard vacuum. Uh, it's vibration isolated. It's shielded from magnetic fields and, you know, radiation. So there's just a tremendous amount of engineering required to create the very, very quiet, low noise uh, environment for the quantum processor. 
So it was like a deal you got five tons of equipment to support a little, you know, thing the size of a nickel? Well, actually, uh, that's that's exactly true. And it's kind of funny when you compare our system to an HPC system. Uh, our system uh, consumes on the order of 25 kilowatts, which is kind of peanuts in the HPC world. But the thing that's even stranger about that that power consumption is if you look at the quantum processor itself – um, the power consumption on the quantum processor is virtually at zero, and the vast majority of that 25 kilowatts is, uh, you know, it's used to just power the front end servers, and we have pumps, compressors, uh, refrigerators, all that kind of stuff. So it, it really is a very, uh, the quantum processor itself is essentially like uh, almost zero, zero power dissipation. Now, I'm going to go back to the architecture here a bit. So if you look at this kind of as an accelerator, how does the data work? This is – and again, I could very well just be stuck in, in today's model of, of computing with accelerators. But one of the traditional problems we have is you have up in main memory you know, this whole chunk, your, your data set, which could be large. And you have to transfer that data down to the accelerator and then the processor is down in the accelerator – chomp on that is that the same model here or you know where does the, how does the data fit into how your processor operates that's my question i suppose sure yeah so um you know if, if you have a, a you know reasonably sized application then you've got you know some kind of data set and that's got to be managed by the front end processor the classical uh, host um, the quantum processor, uh, you know, it, it takes in uh, one quantum machine instruction at a time, just like a classical processor takes in one machine instruction at a time. And then when the quantum processor gets its quantum machine instruction, um, you know, it goes through this process of looking for the best uh, points in this huge search space, and those get uh, returned back to the, the host. Okay, so uh, is it really kind of the same problem that we have in classical computing that, you know, I'm, I'm still, even if I, I load a cache line or, or much of the cache at the same time, I'm still looking at one, you know, 32-bit or 64-bit quantity at a time by the processor. Are you, you have the same kind of architectural design in, in your processor? Absolutely. That's a great analogy. Um, with our machine, uh, you know, the machine executes one quantum machine instruction at a time. And that quantum machine instruction has a bunch of um, information that you, can, that you can pack into it. But it's certainly not going to be able to allow you to pack megabytes or gigabytes of data into it. So in the same way with a classical computer that we have these great algorithmic techniques for taking a huge data problem and breaking it down into lots and lots and lots of uh, small instructions – we're looking at the same kind of uh, strategies in the quantum world where even though that we've got a big data problem, we're, we're trying to figure out how to decompose that into uh, bite-sized chunks where each bite-sized chunk now fits into the quantum processor. So to increase performance on one of these things, it's probably a lot better to just keep making a, a system that has more qubits, right? You can Because you get exponentially more states you can simultaneously look at than the way we would do on a normal system, which is, you know, increase the number of cores or increase the number, you know, which would be unattached with no relationship between them or increasing clock Well, speed. actually, Brock, you make a very interesting point there because in increasing performance in parallel computing, we add more cores, which means we're looking at more data simultaneously. Yeah, but that'd be which linear. Which is uh, analogous to adding more qubits. Am I off base here? No, that's that's it, it is analogous. So that's that would be uh, that's one way that we want to you know make the system more powerful, more qubits. That's the that's kind of the easiest uh, metric for people to grab onto. But you know, in addition to just qubits, the other uh, piece of the architecture that's very very important is what we call couplers. Okay, I'll bite. What's a coupler? <laughs> Well, a coupler is the way that a user can cause one qubit to influence another qubit. So if you imagine that each qubit has, you know, kind of a, a, a built-in uh, tendency to either turn on or turn off, 
that's okay, but unless you can cause one qubit to influence other qubits, then you haven't really built any interesting interactions into the system. So in addition to the qubits of the system, we also have thousands of couplers, and those couplers uh, are the way the user or the programmer um, kind of expresses the influence that one qubit has on another qubit. Okay, so you, you just talked about two two methods slash metrics of, of increasing performance. I mean, what else? I mean, I feel like we just keep going down the rabbit hole. My head here is totally exploding because you're like, oh, wait, I've still got yet another trick, which is it blows your mind even more. What, what else you got? Well, uh, I'm, I'm going to try not to blow your mind too much here, but the um, the the last thing that we really uh, fight constantly in the in the kind of the engineering of these systems is um, is the thermal effects and noise. Um, at, you know, I think uh, Brock, you were referring to this earlier. You know, if if you have a system at at uh, you know finite temperature, that means you've got energy sloshing around in the system, and that energy can uh, disrupt your your quantum state. So that's a bad thing. We're always trying to figure out ways to reduce that uh, those thermal effects, and very uh, very closely related stuff is uh, is what we think of as being kind of like uh, intrinsic control error. The idea is, uh, you know, kind of the way I think about it is if you're driving a high-performance car and you've got your hands on the steering wheel, you want the front wheels of the car to respond very, very sensitively to the motions of the steering wheel. But there's a, you know, there's a mechanical linkage between the steering wheel and the wheels. And so you don't expect that, you know, it's perfectly going to reflect, uh, you know, the, the front wheels aren't going to perfectly reflect what you're doing with the steering wheel. In the same way with our computer, you can dial in all these uh, weights for the qubits and these coupling strengths, but the system may not perfectly reflect the landscape that you've tried to dial in. And so, you know, we're trying to constantly minimize that sort of uh, that control error while we're also adding qubits and adding couplers. Sure. So obviously these systems require a lot of special TTUs, but there's a lot of people out there who know about these different theories. Um, but also they require these, you know, special, you know, hard vacuum, really low temperature. How can someone just get access to one of these systems? Because I assume they're probably not the price of a desktop. Uh, yeah, the list price is rather high. Um, and there are not a lot of these systems out there. Um, you know, we have some at, uh, in, you know, in the lab back in uh, uh, Vancouver where, uh, where all, all the systems are built. And then Google's got one that they share with NASA, and Lockheed's got one that they share with uh, University of Southern California, and uh, Los Alamos has one as well, uh, or they're in the process of getting one. So fundamentally, if you're interested in actually getting access to one of these systems, um, the model is kind of a, a cloud model, quantum cloud. You're going to get access you know, over the Internet to one of these systems that I mentioned, and you know the you know uh, the way that you're going to probably do it is having an affiliation with uh, either a university or some research organization that has ties with one of the places I mentioned. Um, and then you know you you uh, talk to your buddies and you say I've got a great uh, idea for for you know uh, an application that could run on one of these quantum computers. Um, you know, please tell me how to go about getting time. Okay, and where can people find out more about D-Wave systems and quantum computing? Well, uh, a great way is to start with our website. You know, we've got uh, a website at uh, www.dwavesys.com, and uh, we, um, you know, we we do our best. We're a small company, but we do our best to uh, respond to you know invitations that are you know uh, kind of have real merit and interest. Uh, we go out and give talks. Um, you know, I'm going to be in Washington D.C. next week, and we'll visit a, a number of uh, you know entities out there, and you know try to educate them about what we've been able to do in the last year, and uh, you know drum up some interest. Um, so uh, check out our website. Um, that's a great starting point, and uh, you know we've got uh, we've got. Uh, oops, I'm I'm <laughs> trailing off into nothing this year. Um, I think the the right answer is website. Yeah, this was fascinating. I feel like we could talk to you for for hours because, uh, like I said, it just there feels like there's just so much more down the rabbit hole we could go. But we are somewhat limited. Our 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 uh, listeners like to have podcasts that are less than six hours in length, so we probably do need to cut this off. Thank you for your time. 
Sure, I hope you got I hope you guys got what you needed. Thanks much for your questions. Thank you.